we doing to create that frictionless experience for our customers, for our members, as we're trying to get them to do the things that we want them to do? Welcome to the industry's leading business podcast for fitness owners and managers. This month's interviews are brought to you by our podcast partner, Precore. Through experienced design, Precore delivers best-in-class products, top-ranked service, unparalleled expertise and resources needed to help facility operators win. To find out more, visit Precore.com or click on the link in today's show notes. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining me. My special guest for today is Robert Barnes, the Country Manager Asia Pacific for Higher Logic, an industry leader in cloud-based engagement platforms. Prior to his current role, Robert held chief executive roles in Australia and New Zealand over a 20-year period, including CEO of Australian Canoeing and GM of Operations for Fitness Australia. I am also thrilled to tell you that Robert will be taking part in the Fitness Industry Technology Summit that's happening in Sydney, Australia on July 25th and 26th, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that shortly. As for today, we're going to be focusing on ways that we can engage and connect with our customers. Specifically, Robert starts by sharing solutions that achieve true engagement. We chat about the potential challenges of putting all of your energy into building a community on Facebook and other social media platforms, what it means to have an omni-channel approach to engagement and how it works. And to finish off, Robert shares three actions that you can implement to immediately improve engagement with your members and your clients. Now, once you've listened to Robert today, I am sure that you're going to want to catch his panel discussion at the Fitness Industry Technology Summit. So I've included a link in today's show notes, or you can go directly to fitnessindustrytechsummit.com.au and register. Most importantly, when you do that, make sure you use the code ACTIVE, A-C-T-I-V-E, to save $100 on your registration. Now, we're about to hear this week's interview with Robert, but first, thank you to our podcast partner, Precore. Precore knows that service and support rank high on the list when you're choosing fitness equipment. They strive to provide the best customer service to you through taking a thoughtful and genuine approach. Precore equipment is designed to be easy to use and simple to maintain, and their service team is happy to help you over the phone, via email, and in person. Find out why Precore has the best customer service in the fitness industry. Just visit precore.com forward slash customer hyphen support. A very warm welcome to my special guest, Robert. Welcome along. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me. It's great to be here. Now, I think it's fair to say that the way that we interact with our members and with our customers is changing and it has been changing for some time. And more and more often these days, our consumers expect that a business is going to have multiple touch points at every step of the consumer journey. Now, today we're going to be talking about engagement and I thought a good place to start is perhaps you can define the term engagement for us. Sure, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that what is happening these days is that engagement itself is tended to be discussed now in terms of the technology that's being used to deliver it as opposed to what it actually looks and feels like to us as human beings. So to some degree, you know, the the fact that we use the word engagement so often now to define anything from, you know, your sales pipeline process to customer relations, it it is starting to, I think it's starting to be overused and and sort of misinformed in, in some way, shape or form. So what I like to talk about when we define engagement is the way it makes you feel. So most people like being regulars. You know, that sense of, you know, when you walk into your studio, and I love it when I walk into my fitness studio, my, I work out at Vision Personal Training, and I walk in there and they all greet me by my name, you know, and they know what workout I'm, I'm there to do that day and then they ask me for help. And so that experience, the way that makes me feel uh, is engagement for me. I'm more engaged and ready to work out um, when that happens. It's the same when you walk into your favourite coffee shop, right? The barista knows your name. 
starts preparing your usual coffee for you, you're kind of ready to go uh, and you've had to do very little. It's kind of this frictionless experience. And so um, that's, a, that's a term that I'd like to hear more when we talk about engagement is what are we doing to create that frictionless experience for our customers, for our members, as we're trying to get them to do the things that we want them to do. They're both great examples, ones that I'm sure that we can all relate to. So, Robert, where is it that we should actually start looking when it comes to solutions that are going to help us achieve real engagement? So I think it's in the, in the way that uh, I guess it's what we know about our members already. We know a lot about them without even necessarily picking up on everything that we do know. It takes a bit of a deep dive to sit down and get some customer feedback. It's understanding from them how do our existing members feel when they experience, you know, participating uh, in the activities that we're that we're offering, and it's a lot of qualitative. There's a lot of qualitative evidence that's already available to us, which we don't often take the time to sit down and kind of dig into. When you do take the time to do those sorts of things, and it can't necessarily. You can get some data from surveying, um, you know, doing electronic surveys and the like, but there's nothing quite like, you know, a five, five minute conversation with people as they walk in the door, um, or as they're, um, you know, finishing their workouts or whatever it might be, and sort of getting an understanding. Just you start to get the feel for what is a trend. What is there a common theme amongst what I'm hearing from my members, from my customers, that yeah, it is making them excited or perhaps disengaging them. You know, the opposite is also true. So where should we start looking is is where we already know we've got some strength and that's in the relationship with our existing members. And secondarily, it's adding that to, you know, having that as an overlay to the data points that we are already keeping on, on our members. And that's a challenge in the sense that we can be easily overwhelmed by the multitude of places we are keeping data. On our on, yeah, for our businesses, uh, and trying to bring that together into a cohesive environment, and I think that that's where the technology side of things is starting to drive a lot of advances now. Is is aggregating the multitude of uh, data points into a place that's easily translated into something that can help us make business decisions. So, you know, the two places that I would suggest that we that we're going to start looking is what's right in front of us, what's tangible, the relationships that we already have with members, with exiting members. You can get a lot from exit interviews, right, from people that are leaving are leaving your facility uh, for whatever reason and then overlaying that onto the, the quantitative information that we're already keeping and keeping it relatively simple, right? You know, we're often overwhelmed by the information and then overwhelmed by the numbers of ways we could address some of the issues that we experience and so we've got to be super focused on what is our actual objective at this point and aligning our activity to those objectives. I think that's a really key word that you just used is that overwhelm because I would imagine for anyone that's got, you know, hundreds or thousands of members within their facility, it's quite a daunting task to think about spending that time and sitting down with people and, and even though we know how important that is, the practicalities of doing that can sometimes feel a little bit overwhelming. Now you mentioned And the numbers of places we keep that data as well, right? We've got yeah. CRMs and we've got yeah. our uh, point of sale systems and we've got email marketing systems and we've got all these things and often they are still not integrated, right? The numbers of businesses that I come across in day-to-day life that still have five, six, seven, eight different silos of data that they're trying to address all sort of separately, that's a real challenge to a business owner just being (laughs) overwhelmed by the numbers of solutions that they actually have in place and don't realise. Absolutely. I think this is huge, Robert. So I guess in in your experience, if someone is in that exact situation where they have got uh, all these different silos of where they're containing information, then on top of that, they're trying to layer the one-on-one conversations that they're having, where do we even start to try and filter that down to get to the point that you're talking about? Is there any advice that you can share with us around that area? Uh, yeah, so the, the, at a strategic level, it's about alignment to to the to the mission. It's an mm-hmm. alignment to the core goals of the business. If you are in a stage of your business where growth is important, then something like profitability may not necessarily be as important at this point in time because you're looking to grow numbers so that you can reach capacity. 
And so if you're on a growth path, the kinds of data points that you're interested in are going to be more related to, you know, how many people have made an inquiry into the business but haven't converted into member? Um, how many, if, we're, if we've got exiting members, you know, why are they leaving the business and are there things that we can address there that are going to, because if you've got exiting members, that's not going to help your growth rate. So I think the questions that you ask around growth, if that's your ultimate goal in whatever defined period of time, if it's this year, if it's the next three years, those questions are, are super important. So as opposed to, okay, we're, we're at capacity, we're now looking for profitability. And so, you know, the data points are going to be our cost per member, our revenue per member, the capacity of the business as well, how many members, you know, what's our maximum number and, and how well penetrated into that number are we at this point in time? Uh, if you align the questions that you're asking for to your core goals of your business, then you'll know where to start looking for that data. It could be financial data. And so you're going to be looking at your, you know, your, your debiting partner and, and understanding what the, uh, what the financial information is. You'll look into your CRM to understand those relationships. You'll understand tenure of your, of your members. Um, and so form follows function is kind of a saying that I, I, I like to use in that the form that a solution will take is driven by the function that you're trying to perform. And so if the function is to understand, you know, more qualitatively what engagement means to your members at this point in time, then you're, the, the form, you know, the technology or the, uh, the way that you find out that information is going to be very different if you had a different set of goals for the business at that point in time. So form follows function has kind of been a tried and true um, little mantra of mine, I guess, for some time now, so that it helps you uh, navigate the multitude of ways you could answer some of those questions and get really defined. Because more often than not, businesses have got access or, or are keeping systems or keeping databases, if you like, as simple as work around Excel spreadsheets that they don't realize just how reliant on that information they actually are to run that business. But when you ask them what databases they have, they forget that they're even there. And yet it's one of the most important data points that their staff might be using to manage the customer relationship on a day in day out basis. That was a great way to break it down, Robert. Thank you for that. And I like that concept of going back to think about what it is that we're trying to achieve and asking some some simple questions to get started. You know, when we talk about our customer journey, when we talk about engaging with our customers, uh, there's no denying that one of the words that kind of pops into that conversation is social media and Facebook and the way that we actually uh, interact and engage with customers on those social platforms. In your experience, Robert, what's wrong with using Facebook or other social media groups to engage with your customers? In short, there's nothing wrong with it. It definitely serves a purpose. I think the challenges around using public social media platforms to solve some of our business uh, 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 issues is uh, we don't own any of the data that happens on those platforms. And they're designed with Facebooks or Twitters or LinkedIn's business objectives in mind. They're not designed for us. One of the attractions of public social media, and particularly something like Facebook, is that we take the view that all our members or our potential members are already there on that platform. You know, 70% of adults in the world have got a Facebook profile or whatever the statistic might, you know, is at the moment. So we go, well, they're already there. Great. We don't need to find them. We just need to create a space for uh, them to come to and interact with us. And so the challenge with that is, is you, you start a Facebook group and uh, for the purposes of trying to engage your existing members, which is typically why uh, fitness businesses start up a Facebook group in the first place. It's to engage our existing customers in dialogue, discussion, sharing, whatever it might be. Uh, and I'm part of one of these for my own, <laughs> for my own studio. Mm -hmm. um, and so I see it day in and day out. When you start one of those groups, you start from zero. There might be a couple of billion people in Facebook already. But when you start your group, it starts at zero people in there. It's not integrated with your customer database. You still have to go and find all your members in Facebook and you still have to do the kind of work that's going to attract them to join that group and use that group for the purpose that you want them to use it. 
all the while you're at the whim of the Facebook algorithm to determine how easy it is to find them, how easy it is for them to join. And then you may do a lot of work uh, in uh, you know, what would be inbound marketing, if you like, to attract these people into that group. You've got to do a lot of work to get them there. And then you've got to do a lot of work to keep them there and actually doing the thing that you wanted them to do in the first place, which is to converse, which is to respond to, hey, we'd like to set up this new class who's interested in doing that. You've got to do all this work. All the while, you are building, the, the analogy that I use is you are building this house for your existing members, but you're building it on rented land with no lease. So as we've experienced across LinkedIn, particularly LinkedIn groups, so they changed the permissions on that, it'll change with Facebook as well. If you continue to build this house and do all this work and either of those public social media companies decides to change the rules on you, they can do that. And all of a sudden, you've got no access to your house anymore and your members have got no access to your house. And so the challenge with public social media is exactly that. You uh, have all this effort to build that, to build the house, to bring everybody in and to have what are, you know, really rich and fun conversations and lots of sharing going on. Secondarily, there are things like privacy and security issues. Not everybody loves to share everything on a public social media platform. Uh, everybody's there, potentially, but are they going to share the kinds of information that you want them to share? Are they going to put themselves out there and say, yes, I'm open to do a six-week weight loss challenge because at the moment I'm a little bit overweight and I'd like to get myself in shape. Do I want to post my before photos on there? Maybe not. From a more technical perspective, one of the big challenges is the integration of data. We are already as fitness business owners and managers overwhelmed by the number of places, the number of silos where we have data that's important to help us make business decisions. The last thing we need is another place where there is not integrated data. So we may have a stronger picture of our member and the relationship with our member from a Facebook group and we don't own any of that data than we do in our own CRM. And of course, it's a little bit easier to use mostly than CRMs and et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the challenges is where do I do my work? Where do I interact with my member? Do I just keep doing it on Facebook because it's easy and it's simple and I can see them and I understand what they're doing? Or do I do it in my CRM, which is the data that I own and my member owns, which should drive that relationship? And I would hazard a guess that most would say I would rather drive it out of my CRM because it's secure and it's safe and the CRM is integrated with my point of sale system, my CRM is integrated uh, with my direct debiting company, my, it, it's integrated so we can share and create that, what would I say is a, you know, that holistic picture of the relationship that I have. Part of the other things around, there's lost opportunity. So when you are building a house on your own land, <laughs> when you are creating a community behind your own website um, with, you know, with products that do online communities for, you know, for member-based organisations and the like, uh, there's a, an opportunity for you to drive inbound traffic and SEO. And so when we get really technical about marketing, you want to be found on the internet and you want people to come and not only to buy from you but to continue to drive a relationship with you. If you're doing that in public social media, all the benefit of the being searchable uh, and the inbound marketing is going to the public social media platform. It's not going to you. And so, you know, one step further on from that, there's potentially missed revenue opportunities because there's, there's little chance of you to upsell or cross-sell uh, into data that you don't own as well. Uh, they're more likely to uh, be targeted by the Facebook algorithm driving ad revenue um, than they are to be able to be driven to something that you're trying to, to, to bring them into. Um, and so you're at the, you know, I guess you're at the mercy of people uh, and a company that does this for a living uh, compared to the resources that you might be able to apply to it yourself. Robert, let's take a look at this term omnichannel. Can you first help us understand what omnichannel means, what that, that approach is, and how does it actually work in relation to uh, engaging our customers and our members? Absolutely. So one of the things we talked about really early on was about this content of creating um, a personalised experience. And so we experience these things as consumers all day, every day. And, the things, and in a lot of cases, we don't even understand just how... Uh, 
pervasive, I guess is a word you could use, but it's, it sounds a little bit bad, but we just don't understand how embedded in our lives these personalised experiences actually are. It could be as simple as going to the coffee shop and your local barista knows you and gets your almond latte ready before you ever walk in the door. That's one part of it. But there's other, other ways that we experience this level of personalisation. Personalisation is driven by really clever omni-channel engagement. Uh, and so uh, omni-channel engagement is, is, is essentially it's cross-channel, it's content strategy, uh, it's what they use to create this personalised experience for us. It is rarely used well in my experience in the fitness industry and in other industries that I've been involved in because it's a challenge to how many different places am I trying to have some contact with the people I would like to be members and then also my members that I already have. And so, you know, this omni-channel approach uh, and a lot of cases it's about using software which allows us to understand where all these touch points are and what's the most effective touch point for my business at any point in time. Uh, the end result of a really strong omni-channel uh, engagement strategy is that when Rob walks into Vision Personal Training Sylvania, I get the welcome that I like, I get access to the services that I want on the day that I want them and that makes me feel like it's that's just the normal for me but it's, a, it's very different to my wife who walked in three seconds behind me. She gets the experience that she wants that engages her because we're completely different people. It's quite challenging to achieve that, particularly if you're, you know, if you're a sole proprietor or you're a business owner that's got a thousand other things to do, and that's where technology can help. But ultimately, that's what a really successful omni-channel engagement strategy will do is create that personalised experience that's going to keep me going back. You mentioned before that you haven't really seen any uh, fitness businesses in particular doing this well. Is there an example outside of the fitness industry that you could share with us of someone that is doing a great job of this omni-channel approach? Uh, yeah, so you know, one that I would um, I, I kind of ref I think about now is is ING Bank. Mm -hmm. interestingly. And so I think the way that they've taken on providing information, uh, the way that they have uh, marketed the product, the way that they've made it easy to use is, is an example of one that I, that I would call out, even though it's in the banking industry, which is a challenge, right? So, um, <laughs> but, but one of the things that um, is successful about that and, and one of the things that I think is also successful uh, that I've noticed actually in the association industry that I work in quite heavily is what the technology does is allows the association to get out of the way. So here's a really interesting discussion point. One of the things that technology does is, is allows us to stop trying to prescribe what we think is the right experience for our members. So at the highest level, we are still treating all our members, regardless of whether we've got 500 of them or 5,000 of them. We are typically still treating them all and messaging them all and communicating to them all based on what we think we know about them from our CRM or other data source, right? Uh, and so we're getting the same email message. It might be personalised, like it says, Dear Rob, instead of Dear Chantal. Mm -hmm. But that may be the level of personalised, but you might get, be getting marketed, you know, particular group exercise classes, and I might be getting marketed group exercise classes, and they don't even know that I hate group exercise classes. I just want to do PT and strength. And so how engaged am I going to be in that kind of messaging when they don't even know that I don't like those things? So what the technology is allowing us to do today is to self-identify or to self-select. It helps the business, or in my case, with some of my customers, their associations, is to help them get out of the way of making those decisions because the software can identify the behavior that I'm taking when I'm engaging in certain uh, whether it's an email message or it's an online form or I'm in an online community, a private online community that's seeing what am I posting about, what am I liking, what am I engaging with. It's collecting all this information. It's painting a picture. But I can identify myself in a way that normally is getting prescribed by the business. And so what I really like about what software is capable of doing for us today uh, is it's gathering behavioural data that actually is coming from the, the member doing the activity themselves and it's learning about us without the business um, having to get in the way of that relationship.
Robert, let's dive in a little deeper into understanding the omnichannel approach. Can you walk us through the process that's involved? There's kind of five steps that you can go through to achieve a really strong engagement program uh, across this. And first step is, ga- is gathering all that behavioural data. Mm-hmm. Um, now, that in and of itself for a lot of businesses is going to be quite challenging to start with because we don't know everywhere where that data is being kept at the moment, but that's the first most important thing that a fitness business can do is work out and literally map out on a table where are we collecting behavioural information from about what our members and what people who are looking to be members are doing. The second thing is to start breaking down the silos of that data and bringing a lot of that data together. In some cases, that may mean some consolidation of your technology solutions. Um, In most cases, that's probably the case. If it's in too many places and it's not useful to you to make business decisions because it's not integrated. So that would be the second thing is to start trying to amalgamate, if possible, as much of that data. And that could be just done on a monthly basis. You know, you bring together all this information and, and produce a report which helps you make business decisions. Again, those should be aligned to your goals your strategic and operational goals for the business. The third thing is about segmenting. And we hear about segmentation of members a lot, mainly when it comes to marketing and mainly when it comes to outbound marketing. We have to decide what are the personas of the people we want to attract to our business. And so we create marketing messages for those kinds of people and put it out there and hopefully we get a response back. But the kinds of segmentation that you can do of your existing databases you know, is incredible with a really good technology solution. But it's understanding then the types of people that stay in our business and spend the most money in our business over this period of time look like this uh, and then making sure that they are getting the kinds of messages that they want. And that's where that personalised experience starts to come in is when you have created a really strong segmentation of your member base Uh, And then step four, hey, personalise your content. Make sure that the message that comes to me is for me and it recognises that I've been training for two years, that I'm currently injured and I don't start my new program for another two weeks. My gym knows all of this information. Are they using it to help create their experience for me yet? Not yet, but they could. And so we'd be surprised, I guess, about what we do know about our members on an individual level. The challenge is where do we keep that information so we can use it to create this personalised content? And then step five, over time, all software that is offering these kinds of services now should offer automation. So the ability then for a member journey, if you like, or a new customer journey, let's talk about it from a new customer perspective, to be automated so that the first 30 days uh, of the experience that I have with my new gym that I just joined uh, is actually an automated process that happens for everyone that joins in. And so it gives business owners the opportunity to, to set and forget. I would like my first 30 days for any new member to be this. This is the kind of message that I would like them to get. At at day seven, they should get this message. At day 12, they should get this message. At day 14, with a true marketing automation platform in play, they can get all of that and it can happen automatically. And once the database gets updated with the new member, whether that came from a web inquiry or from someone manually entering a new member into the system, that's the experience that they will start getting. And as you well know, that first 30, 60, 90 days is kind of pivotal in creating the level of engagement that's going to keep me there for longer. If I'm doing a 12-week challenge, I've got 12 weeks to create the kind of personalized experience that's going to keep that person in the facility for another 12 months, not just for another 12 weeks. And if you're trying to do that across thousands of potentially new customers, the more you can use the automation systems that are available in most modern uh, software products now, the better you're going to be able to do that. So because we have covered so much ground today, Robert, in relation to engagement and, um, and starting to automate some of our processes within the business, I'd like to finish off with some really practical takeaways for everyone today. So do you want to leave us today with some actions that people can implement immediately to really start to improve their engagement with members and with clients within their club? 
We will hear those Fitbizpiration tips from Robert in just a minute. But first, here's a message from our podcast partner, Jim Sales. Jim Sales allows you to plan, implement, and monitor a proactive sales strategy that's automated and uniform. You can give your sales team the tools they need to capture, nurture, and convert new members, which means it's easier than ever before to grow your member base. Make sure you head over to gymsales.net to find out more information. Now back to Robert with his final tips on ways to improve engagement with our members and clients. Here's what he had to say. For me, it's, it's, it, like it might not be the sexiest response, but the first, the first place is to get a handle on where you've got your data. Where is all the information about your members and the people that you're trying to get members? Where, is all, where does all that live right now? And how deep and wide is that? So getting a handle on the data, gather it all in sort of one place and then try and align that. So then the second thing is to align that to your goals. You know, what I know about the work that, um, you know, JT and others do in, in coaching fitness businesses is to be really tight on what your goals are on a monthly, quarterly and an annual basis. And so when you've got a really good picture of this is all the information I have about my business and the people that are in my business, um, staff and members, and I have a really good, you know, I'm really committed to this set of goals it's then starting to make that alignment occur. What do I need to know in order to drive activity and effort and resource into achieving those business objectives? Uh, and so the alignment between the two uh, is, is really critical in, 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 this, in, this, uh, uh, in this path forward. Uh, and then the third and the last thing is understanding is the technology, is the platform that you are currently using on a multitude of platforms likely, is that helping you drive the growth in your engagement? So is it actually serving you up what you need? Is it the right form for the function, if that makes sense? To go back to what we talked about before, form follows function. So if the function of your engagement strategy is to drive growth or it's to drive retention or it's to become profitable or whatever that might be, uh, it's making sure that the, the, the software technologies that you're currently using to make decisions around your business are actually supporting supporting that, uh, that objective. They're great takeaways to finish up on today, Robert. Now, I am not letting you get away before we talk about the Fitness Industry Technology Summit. So for oh, all yeah. Can't our, wait for this. Can't wait. <laughs> this is very important as well. So for all of our Aussie listeners out there, you will have heard me speak about the Fitness Industry Technology Summit, which is coming up in Sydney on July the 25th and 26th. Now, we are very lucky to have Robert join us as a speaker at that event. So, Robert, give us a bit of a uh, an overview as to what we're going to hear from you during the summit. What I'm excited about is, is it's kind of the first of its kind for, for the industry here in Australia. What I'm even more excited about is we get to participate, right? So what um, I'm actually hosting a panel. And so one of the things that I uh, was super keen on in my entire time in the fitness industry is to try and bring some new voices and some new perspectives into the industry from seemingly completely industries completely outside the, the, the scope of influence for the for fitness business owners and so i'm hosting a panel discussion i've got an accountant <laughs> i've got um, a payroll expert uh and i and i've got an, a, an accounting software um uh industry expert who specializes in franchises which we know is a, you know is a very big part of, of our fitness industry and so i've got this panel and we're going to just be talking about what are the day-to-day -day apps that businesses could be using to uh, and business owners can be using uh, to make their lives easier. What what should we be looking at that could be changing our lives and it's probably sitting there right in front of our face, but we've never thought about them uh, in the context of actually running a fitness business. And so we're going to explore you know, cloud-based software. We're going to explore the world of apps. I like to call it the app universe. And so we are going to be astronauts and explore <laughs> this whole universe um, on behalf of fitness businesses and see if we can't, um, just like I was able to surprise you with the app called Align today, at the, at, uh, uh, you know, as, as an app that I use to, to keep my business aligned. That's kind of a new thing. Uh, I'm sure there are some other new apps uh, and some technologies that, that, that my panel are going to be able to share with the industry that they would never have thought was uh, actually going to be beneficial to them running a fitness business. 
I have no doubts whatsoever. And I love this idea of learning from people from outside our industry, people that we wouldn't necessarily uh, hear from on a day-to-day basis. So I'm really excited about the event, Robert, and I'm thrilled to hear that you're going to be hosting a panel. And it sounds like some sensational panelists that are going to be taking part. Now, that's only just a little snippet of what is happening at the Fitness Industry Technology Summit. So for those of you that are interested in coming along and joining us, then once again, it's on July 25th and 26th in Sydney, Australia. I'm going to put all of the details in today's show notes. And Robert, a huge thank you for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. So thank you for being a guest on the Fitness Business Podcast. Appreciate uh, your time. It's been a pleasure being here. I look forward to catching up soon. Team Rockstar Fit is an award-winning mastermind team that helps fit pros lead happy and balanced lives. Get mentoring and support. Learn how to grow your business online with Beachbody. You can apply for a free consultation today at teamrockstarfit.com. Pre-Core Quick Fire 5. This week's Pre-Core Quick Fire 5 guest is the membership director of Club La Maison Health and Fitness Club, Dory Nugent. Dory, welcome along. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Let's roll straight into our pre-core quick fire five and starting off, why do you do what you do? (laughs) That's like the the age old question, right? I'll, I'll sum it up really easily for you. The industry suits me perfectly and I'll tell you why. There's three components to the industry that again, just suit me perfectly. One, it's fun. I go to work every day. It's super fun. Two, I love the daily change. I, I'm, I embrace change. I love change. I do well with change. And number three, the interaction with others, whether it's the members in the fitness industry or the team or um, my colleagues. Love it. Three great reasons. And tell us, are there any rituals that help you become better at what you do? Um, one, one ritual that I like to do is that I think is important is I get in that gym every single day at 6.30 a.m. and I'm working out. I'm, I'm I just want to be not an employee for 45 minutes. And I think that helps me see things uh, on the different side, you know, not as an employee. It helps me to see things as a colleague, as a, as a member. Um, but I, I really enjoy that. That kind of sets me up for the day. And are there any apps or systems that you use to stay in control of your workload? Oh, yeah. Probably <laughs> out, <laughs> Outlook is my best friend. Um, the calendar and the email help me to survive. Yeah, great one. And a very popular answer is Outlook. <laughs> okay. And, um, are there any books, podcasts, or blogs that you'd recommend and why? Yeah, well, let's see. I just came off of two books back to back. I do a lot of audio books. I have a uh, long commute, so it helps to kill time. I can't, just came off of uh, Don't Hurt Me by David Goggins, which I just absolutely was obsessed over. And then that kind of just took me into the my newest book that I just finished, and that's called Extreme Leadership. It's also, um, it's by two Navy SEALs, Jocko and Lick. Uh, Lee- 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 yeah, yeah, Will Nick and yeah. Leaf Babin. Yes, and I just came off of that one and I, I just loved it. So, Dory, give us a brief overview about what we're going to be chatting about during your main interview. What we're going to talk about today is building a team. I like to call it uh, building an empire because that's how I like to refer to my team as a whole, as, as we have our own little empire at my club. And um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about it, things that have worked for me, um, you know, things that have worked for my leadership style and how I've kind of taken a team that was in complete disarray when I first arrived at my club and kind of feel like we've, I've brought everybody together that we've got a pretty rock solid, we got a pretty rock solid team. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. It sounds amazing. And it's something that I know a lot of us will be interested in hearing. So Dory, thank you for joining us today for the pre-call quick five, five. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me for this week's show. And of course, a reminder that you can grab all the resources and the links for today's episode all at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. I'd now like to thank our foundation partner, Active Management. 
As a listener of the show, you have a special opportunity to work with JT. You can get one free session when you buy one coaching session. No matter where you are in the world, technology allows you to work with him. Just go to activemgmt.com.au forward slash FBP family and work with JT to get more people moving and moving more often. That's one free session when you buy one coaching session and it is exclusive to you. Go to activemgmt.com.au forward slash FBP family. Thank you all so much for joining me for today's episode. I look forward to seeing you next time. And remember, what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. Mm -hmm.